Hey, where I check and freak out in the suite for that. <laughs> I'm better at it. Earlier, I used to be like, why is in the starting? Why is in the starting? What did I mess up? What did I mess up? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. That part went through as well, so I look like an idiot there. But uh, hopefully, the awesome presentation will make up for that funny start. Uh, hey, everybody! Welcome back to the Jack Stock series. Uh, kindly hosted with the help of Christian Garcia, who's now I'm not sure if you saw the tweet, but he's working on Jackson in official capacity still at uh, Consite. So that's awesome. Christian, welcome back. Hey, everyone. Hey, Samjan. Hey, Patrick. Thank you for having me, guys. Awesome. Uh, we're super excited to host Patrick. Uh, Patrick uh, Kijer, Doctor Kijer. I was corrected before the talk. He's just completed his PhD. Uh, works on stuff that I'll pretend I understand all of. Uh, he is. Uh, he's just completed his PhD at Oxford, and he works on neural ODs, STs, and time series. Uh, I only know bits and pieces of that. If you want to know more about him, you can go to his Twitter profile. There he has his thesis pinned on the top of his profile. Uh, you can find his work there. Today, he'll be talking about Diffrax. And again, I'll say a few more words which are quite scary to me. It's a jax based suite of ordinary stochastic and controlled differential equation solvers, roughly analogous to the existing Torch Diffric packages. Uh, this is available uh, in the Jax ecosystem, and Patrick will be telling us more about it. Uh, Patrick, thanks so much again for joining us. No worries at all. Thanks for having me, guys. Let me start by sharing my screen, and I'll take it away. OK, you can all see it, I hope? Uh, I don't see it now. It popped up we, first. We, it popped up, but we lost it. Oh, oh no, OK, fine. I thought if we do it like this. Uh, I don't think you're sharing it right now. Yeah, I don't know, that's not Could you please reshare? Yeah, not a great start. Eh? <laughs> okay, so sharing, infinite descent. Yes. Switch to this. Can you see it? Yep, second time's the charm. <laughs> oh, all right, there we go. And then all good? Yep, that looks great. Uh, amazing. Let's take it Off over. we go. Okay, so in that case, hello everyone. It's great to be here. So, as I was introduced, my name is Patrick. Um, and today I'm going to be talking a bit about Diffrax uh, for the sake of everyone here who is hopefully really thoroughly invested in the JAX ecosystem and thinks it's the coolest thing ever, just like I do. Um, so program today, um, I'm going to just give you four bullet points and that's I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction. You know, what am I talking about today? Why is this interesting? Um, we're going to jump into a live coding demo. Always a bit of a scary thing to do in a talk. Hopefully it'll work out. Let's see. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about using Diffrax, like why should you care about this as an end user? Um, but then I think hopefully what should be a bit more interesting is actually towards the end of the talk is I will open it up and then we'll look at some of the internals and some of the, the cool stuff that's happening inside Defax that makes makes Defax possible. So um, obviously modern auto differentiation GPU frameworks, these are amazing, not just for deep learning, but they're also amazing for scientific computing. Um, so we've got things like PyTorch and Julia, of course, but of course also we have JAX. And then what is a backbone of any scientific computing framework? Uh, that is differential equation solvers. We really need to solve differential equations all the time in the sciences. Uh, and so, of course, as you probably guessed, off the back of this, we have Diffrax, which is this suite of numerical differential equation solvers in JAX. Now, why should you care? Well, first of all, maybe you're a scientist or something like that. You need to solve differential equations as part of maybe your model, part of whatever you're up to. Well, then unsurprisingly, something that solves differential equations might be of interest to you. Um, but maybe you're a numerical analyst, or maybe you're a software dev who has to work with differential equation solvers, then Defrax actually introduces a bunch of pretty carefully thought out abstractions that makes doing this uh, either very easy to develop new solvers or to implement existing solvers. Um, and, and the really cool thing, this is what we're going to be seeing a little bit later on on the, the more technical, mathematical end of things, is how it solves ODEs and SDEs in a unified way. Um, but okay, maybe you're not a mathematician, maybe you don't do numerical analysis, nothing like that, but you just take a slightly broader stance, you care about scientific computing in JAX. Well, I'm also going to talk a little bit about this spin out Equinox library that also introduces some cool new tools that will be towards the end. And then finally, hopefully addressing 99% of the audience today, maybe you just care about doing neural networks and deep learning in JAX. Um, well, then actually also we'll see sort of see like a couple of applications towards this end of things as well. 
Um, so my hope is that pretty much no matter your background, whether it's really like all the way down to like needing to solve specific differential equations or just more broadly scientific computing or just more broadly deep learning, um, that uh, in any case, hopefully there's something here for everyone. So this is where I've written coding demo. Let's just, just jump straight in. and I'll show you a little bit uh, of what coding into facts looks like. So I'm only going to give you basically just oh, that's uh, it's not going to work out for that. Um, I'm only going to give you basically just a just just a sort of glimpse at the API more than anything else. Um, so let's get started with Python. Obviously, don't write that in production code. Okay, so um, let's suppose that we want to solve, let's say, an ordinary differential equation. So what we're going to want to solve is this equation here. So that's just exponential decay. We'll see what that looks like as, as a picture in a moment. We're going to solve it using, let's use, let's see, use an off-the-shelf method. So all of this is Jack's code, by the way. It's sort of not super obvious, um, but we're going to solve it that. And then let, let's solve it, say, from this starting point. And probably this doesn't, if you're not familiar with differential equations, maybe this looks a little bit like soup. Don't worry, we'll have a nice pretty picture at the end. And you'll see, you'll see where we're going with this. Uh, so now what we're going to do is say that we're solving an ODE. And just basically just put all those arguments together. And then we get our solution. So you can see that we've solved it all the way down to this final endpoint. And our, this, is the, this is the value of our solution. Um, but I promised you a pretty, pretty picture, so let's do that. So let's say that we want to save it at a thousand points. So uh, did I miss a close bracket? Yes, I did. Um, and now let's let's just give that a plot. Uh, sorry, what I want to do. Now we can. So if solved at t's, this is this is all point we say it's solved there. This is all of the values. And so now having saved it, so having plotted it, um, and we can save that and if I alt tab over, you can see that we have in fact solved exponential decay. So you can see there's a bit of a curve there. Um, so if you are familiar with differential equations and ODEs and so on, you, you know what I mean when I'm talking about exponential decay, then hopefully this makes some kind of sense to you, uh, what you've just seen. Uh, and if not, then hopefully you can at least appreciate your pretty picture. Okay, so that's just a very quick introduction to the API for ordinary differential equations. And you can see, if I just scroll past all of that, you can see basically it's a little bit like playing with Lego, right? I've just written down a bunch of stuff, vector field, you know, T0, T1, I've just sort of specified everything, and then I've just bunged it into this differential equation solve call. And then it saves everything. So it, uh, it solves the whole thing. And in this case, it saves at these thousand points. But I told you as well um, that you know, maybe you do SDEs, say, and you want to be able to solve an SDE. Well, then yes, Defax does this as well. So let's let's uh, take our existing example. We'll modify. We'll make it a little bit more complicated. But in this case, let's start off with exactly the same drift. So this is that exponential decay that we had before. And then we'll introduce a little bit of noise. And then whereas previously we had that was what we had for our term. Well, now we're going to make it slightly more complicated. We're going to add on this noise to turn it into an SDE. And then actually, do you know what? First of all, I should increase the Brownian motion. Let's do that first. Uh, this is, so this is a instance of Brownian motion. So this is a single Brownian sample. And then, of course, we need some sort of uh, PR and key because we're doing GAC. So we need some sort of randomness. Let's just insert that in there. Right, OK. So now let's define our term. So you can see we've got. So that is, yeah, there we go. Maybe let's use an Euler method. So now I'm going to go ahead and just call diff solve again. Um, solver t0, t1, dt0, y0. And then once again, let's, let's save, at, and then let's, this time let's save at all time points. So you actually have the spline. So there's a Git compilation here happening under the hood. Uh, and of course, you also you can wrap the whole thing in a, in a JIT call, and that will also just work. So we've got our output, and then once again, let's let's do what we promised, and then I will also plot at a thousand points. Emap the evaluation. So this is what that's what this dense is doing. It's it's giving me this solve evaluate method, which allows me to evaluate at our points. In this case, I'm going to evaluate at these points. Get these these values out. We'll be top plot these y's 
guilty.savefig dwarf slash mg. Ben, I hope if I go back over there, you can see. Ta da! Okay, so now you can see the this stochastic solution that's been overlaid on top. Uh, so the first one that was the that was the ODE we've solved, and the second one is the SDE we've solved um, over the same time interval. And this is the same differential equation, just, well, same drift part of the differential equation. We've just added on this diffusion as well. Okay. So um, the thing I kind of want to highlight at this point is how, at this point, maybe it looks like I've built a DSL, I've built a domain-specific language, right? That I've sort of introduced all of these concepts. I've introduced all of these solvers and terms and brand new motions and defect solvers and blah, 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 right? And it sort of, it feels like I've invented a whole new language here. Um, the cool thing is here, actually, is that all of this is JAX exactly as normal. Um, when I look at something like this virtual Brownian tree, this is just a pie tree. Multi-term is a pie tree. You can see it has ODE term and control term inside of it. Each of those are pie trees in turn. They have drift, diffusion, BN inside of it. Um, if I was to say, look at this solution object, also a pie tree. It's a pie tree that happens to be a class, happens to have a method I can call. And this is what allows me to then do things like jax.vmap, and I can just evaluate this. So this is something which I think is pretty cool, and it's something I'm going to be touching on a little bit later on in the talk as well, is the extent to which all of this is actually just native JAX, exactly like you're used to thinking about. Um, and this is what, really what allows us to uh, work with uh, these JAX operations, like JAX.vmap and so on, um, around anything else we're doing with the facts. So you shouldn't feel like this is built on top of JAX. You should feel like this is somehow like at the same level of JAX, I think. you know, it, It's using exactly the same stuff. Um, OK. so. That's a quick API demo, mostly just to sort of give you a sense of what working with this library looks like. And, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the features of JAX and how, sorry, of, of DeFax even, um, and how it has the kinds of things that we would expect of a differential equation solving library. And then, as I said, we'll open up the hood and we'll start seeing some of the new stuff that uh, makes, makes DeFax tick inside. So first things first, DeFax has lots and lots of things that you expect in a differential equation solving library. It can solve ODEs and it can solve SDEs. That's a big deal. Uh, it can also solve what we call controlled differential equations. So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is probably very few of you. This is quite a niche bit of mathematics. Um, this is a generalization of both ODEs and SDEs and other kinds of differential equations besides. There's this unifying notion of this thing called a controlled differential equation that somehow captures everything else as a special case. So Diffrax actually implements uh, ODE and SDE solvers by reducing them to CDE solvers and doing everything in that space. Um, which is something I'll be touching on a bit more in terms of the theory later. Uh, and at this point, it simply suffices to say that there's uh, that we can solve the, these very general kinds of differential equations as well. Um, you've got all the other things you need. You have high-order solvers. You have implicit solvers for, for stiff problems. You've got things like synthetic solvers, dot, 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 dot. Um, we have dense solutions. We saw that earlier. Uh, that was when we had, what was it gone? This, uh, this dense equals two. This is the thing that gives us this evaluate method that allows us to evaluate at arbitrary time points get our solution at arbitrary time points. So Defrax supports this. Um, uh, adroit methods for backpropagation. So those of you who follow the neural differential equation literature, probably, you know, you, there was this neural ordinary differential equation paper, one best paper in Europe, uh, 2018. Uh, and it very so it did a lot to popularize some of the, one of these alternate methods of backpropagating through a differential equation. Um, and and the, there are, in fact, multiple ways of backpropagating through a differential equation. And, and Defrax supports these. Um, and so I've mentioned neural differential equations just now. Yes, you can absolutely do these in Defax. Um, there's things like step size controllers. So what we saw in these examples, I just wrote uh, dt naught equals, I mean, I, I think it was somewhere above, but what I wrote was uh, was, was this. I wrote dt naught equals 0 0.0.1. 0 .1. That is to say it's, it's this constant fixed step size. Um, in practice, actually, you often want to adapt your step size and do something smart there. There are advanced, particularly advanced ways of doing that. Defect supports these. So we're going to come state of the art there. Um, this is where I now lean more into the scientific computing and the more like the jacks and the cob side end of things, where I start saying we can VMAP or grab over anything. And at this point, maybe you're not surprised because you do jacks, you know jacks, and of course you can VMAP over anything. That's what that's the point of jacks, right? You can do that. And of course you can differentiate anything because it's just jacks, and jacks allows you to do that. Um, but from the point of view of differential equation solving libraries, this is really new. It's pretty common to be able to batch over, say, your initial condition. It's pretty common to be able to differentiate with respect to your initial condition. Um, but it's much less common to be able to do either of those with respect to, say, the region of integration that you've chosen to integrate over, or, say, with the tolerances inside your solver, the things that determine how big your step sizes are, um, dot, 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 dot. Um, and this is, a, I think, a really, really nice example of the fact that we've 
because Diffraxel has been built inside of JAX, it's been built inside of this auto differentiation framework. Um, it allows us to do these things completely for free. And this is something that in, in any other framework basically just doesn't exist because it's almost impossible. And that I think is, this is just a huge step change with this ubiquitous differentiable programming that we're starting to see up here. Um, uh, we can use PyTrees as the state. So you saw that on previously, again, it was, it was somewhere further up, so I, I won't type it. I won't go up and find it, but I, I won't why not equals 1.0 here. Well, I mean, if you want to, you can think of that as being a little bit like this, right? You know, I'm just using some array. This is the, the Jack's object that's being passed through and, and, and we're working with it. But if I wanted to, you know, I, I could go ahead and use kind of any old Jack's object. So here I've just done a two people. And, I, and if I write my vector field appropriately, then you can interact with something like this. Um, so, uh, and you can, you know, you can push this as far as you like arbitrarily, any, any old pie tree will work. So this is a nice example, again, where we're, we're leveraging the, the, the functionality that Jack's already provides that if your data is naturally expressed as a pie tree, use it as a pie tree. And this is, this is the thing you can do. Um, uh, and those of you who are thinking about discontinuities, so this actually appears quite a lot in, in the CD literature, um, that yes, this, this is a thing that can be done too. So in short, the fax is, is at least meeting the current state of the art. It is at least doing all of the things that, that we would like it to do that everyone else can do. Um, but more than that, it does this really, really fast. And of course, this is one of the amazing things of the fact that we're building on top of things like Jax.jit, which gives us speed ubiquitously, almost for free. Um, this is really noticeable compared to the PyTorch ecosystem. So in PyTorch, we've built up this ecosystem of differential equation solvers. Um, that been, you know, we've been using them quite a lot, to, in particular in the neural differential equation literature, but in quite a few other things besides. Um, and it's all been built on top of this PyTorch um, framework and, and these, uh, these PyTorch libraries. But the problem is, is that the PyTorch JIT is kind of difficult to work with. Certainly these libraries haven't been built with that expe expectation. Um, and as a result of that, you still have this Python interpreter sitting around and the Python interpreter is slow. It really slows you down, especially in scientific computing workflows where you've just got lots and lots of bitty little operations that need to happen one after the other. And as a result of that, we see Defax with its JIT compilation that sort of you know, get, removes the Python interpreter. We see this being much, much faster than anything you can get in PyTorch. So I've written 1.3 to 20 times faster. Actually, since I made these slides, I've, I've found examples where we're 200 times faster. Um, and that's not crazy. That's just removing the Python interpreter. Um, uh, those of you who are thinking, hang on, scientific computing, Julia, should I be using that? Um, well, actually, we're getting similar speed to Julia. Um, and so, I mean, I think Jack's v. Julia, that's like a whole thing uh, that I'm not going to try and address today. But uh, if you are finding that Julia isn't meeting your needs, then something in this space, something like Defax, may be suitable instead. Um, Defax is really extensible. So you can manually step through this solver if you're writing a differentiable simulator. And what I mean by that is that I go back to my code. If you see this diffx solve line here, this diffx solve, I mean, actually, if you, if you look at the code, for this, this is pretty complicated. It's got a bunch of stuff going on. Um, but fundamentally, it's a glorified for loop. Fundamentally, all it is doing is repeatedly calling solver.step. Um, and it just keeps doing that and keeps doing that. So, and, so, and solver.step is public API. You, you are free to use this if you wish. So if you're in a, a context where it makes sense for you to make a step and then go off and do whatever it is you're off to go and do, um, you can do that too. Um, so you, you, there's a lot of uh, points of extension interface beyond just simply this one defect solve interface. Um, there's lots and lots of these base classes. So um, I've, I've mentioned this abstract solver here. So when uh, we've got here, solver equals Euler. And I think earlier on, we also had solver equals Dopey 5. Uh, that was what I wrote down for the ODE, say. But let's have a look at Dopey 5, actually. So see that actually what we've got here is actually quite a sophisticated collection of abstract base classes. So you've got db5, but this is an abstract explicit longer cutter method. It's also an abstract longer cutter method, abstract adaptive solver, which in turn then hits abstract solver. Um, and so there's this, is, as I said, this is quite a sophisticated collection of different kinds of solver. And you, you're free to mix these in as you, as you wish um, to, to say your solver is of a certain type or not. So this allows you to add custom ops. So uh, you might notice in particular, by the way, the, the interface is not defect solve for solver equals db5. It's, it's, it doesn't look like that, right? Um, you are free to define your own solver if you wish. You don't just have to use the pre-built ones. Um, here's a really nice example for those of you who know what I mean when I say semi-explicit differential algebraic equation, um, which is that uh, when the facts are being designed, we designed it to work with ODEs. We designed it to work with SDEs. We designed it to handle both of these cases in the same unified way. But as it turns out, this same unified way is also capable of handling these other more complicated semi-explicit differential algebraic equations. Um, and we didn't even design it to do that, 
right? That that is a that is almost a fluke, right? That just happened. Um, and the way I like to think about this is simply that we I think this is a good indication that we've hit on the right abstractions. That you know, if you think of like like a machine learning model, right? A machine learning model is good if it generalizes, if it works on the things you did not train it to work on. Um, and exactly the same here, you know, we, we built these abstractions to work with ODs and SDs. And so the fact that it still works in this other, much more complicated regime, I think is a nice indication that we're probably the abstractions we've introduced are, you know, they're a little bit new and, and I think they're, they're the right ones to be working with. Um, so I've told you a lot about the features inside the facts. Let's open up the hood a little bit and I'll start talking about some of the things happening inside to facts and some of the, the things that makes it buzz and the things that, that makes this work. And what, you know, why is it cool? So I mentioned these controlled differential equations earlier. Um, so, and then, then as, as I told you then, ODEs and SDs, these are reduced to CDs and solved in, in a unified way. So what do I mean by that mathematically? Um, well, this is to say, if I write down this, this is just an ordinary differential equation. Um, if, if you're not familiar with this style of notation, by the way, just, please just like divide by dt on both sides, just, you know, quietly pretend that's that's a thing you can do. Um, just, you know, put that dt on the other side and, and it looks like an ODE like you're used to. Um, and, and then you write down, say, this SDE. So again, this is just a standard looking SDE, nothing special there. Well, in some sense, these are both special cases of this notion of a controlled differential equation. That's this thing I've written down here. And I'm not expecting anyone here to be familiar with these. Like I said, these are a relatively esoteric piece of mathematics. Um, but you can you can sort of like intuitively see, I think, that if you look at this and write x of t equals t, if you consider the function f, that is, so if you consider x to be the identity function, then you will see that actually this thing here, that's just an ODE, right? If x is the identity function, this is just an ODE. In, in contrast, if x is equal to t comma w of t, so if x is the identity function and the Brownian motion just put together in a pair, then you can see that what I've written down here is, is essentially the same as the SDE as well. So there's this, more, there's this, there's this general notion of a controlled differential equation, uh, which generalizes ODEs and SDEs and is, and is a, a well-formed concept on its own. Um, and this is really what we exploit in order to do cool solvers inside of facts, in order to, to simplify the internals of the facts far, far further than you, you could do otherwise. Um, so here, here's the explicit Euler's method. This is this is the simplest possible solver for um, for, for an ODE, and so this is this is probably familiar to many of you in the audience. Um, but if then if you also consider, say, the same solver for SDEs, and you can see again, I've just written down the explicit Euler's method. Well, you can see that actually, look, these have a lot of common structure, right? Like in both cases, I have a value in my vector field. I've taken a difference of two things, and then I have some bilinear operation that combines them. So I've got this vector field. I've got a difference of two scalars. And then the bilinear operation is multiplication, f times dt. Meanwhile, if I go, go looking at the diffusion, you can see exactly the same thing, right? I've got this difference in my control, in my Brownian motion, in my, um, in my noise process here. And then f may, may, may say be a matrix, w may be a vector. And then you can see my bilinear operation is a matrix vector product. So you can see that actually we have this common structure um, that describes what's going on here, that describes this interaction between a vector field and its control. And so we can hope to try and write code that does all of this in the same unified way. And so if I go back over here, then this is where we have this thing called an abstract term. And this is the abstract object that represents what's going on here. And so earlier on, you, you saw me write down things like ODE term. Well, actually, if we have a look at this, this hierarchy, you can see actually this is a subclass of abstract term. Um, and all that is capturing is the notion that you have this term, this whole term here, and the fact that it's an ODE is simply describing the fact that it is, it is time that appears here as the control on the right-hand side. And then likewise, also, we saw things like a control term, right? And it's exactly the same story here. It's a term, it has some sort of bilinear operation between vector field and control, and we had our vector field and we had our control that was running in motion. Um, so you can see there's this, there's this um, new idea of, of a term, and of this abstract term that captures what's going on there. So what are the implications of this reduction to you know, this piece of mathematics that I've introduced and sort of drawn in? Why is this cool? Why is this useful? Well, first of all, it's great for me, right? You know, just for me personally, as a library author, uh, I am very, very happy that I get to write less code. This makes my life much simpler. Um, then this sort of takes it, this actually comes in a few different forms. I've discussed solvers already, right? I've told you, oh, I can write one solver and this one solver will work for everything. That's great. But actually, we can go much, much further than this. So I mentioned that there are multiple ways to backpropagate through a differential equation. This is pretty complicated. As you might expect, writing custom backpropagation is kind of difficult. 
Um, it's certainly something you need to sort of do quite carefully to avoid bugs. And this is great, right? I don't have to write it out separately for ODs and SDs and so on. I can just write one implementation. So you can see that we actually um, take advantage of this in actually really quite strong, meaningful, kind of difficult to write ways. Um, uh, oh, oh, and for those of you who are curious, by the way, there, there is some mathematics here uh, that you can find in my thesis. Um, and indeed, the, the same set of abstractions I, I keep introducing, I keep discussing, these, these can handle lots and lots of different kinds of problems. So again, these same abstraction, abstractions handle things like explicit solvers, but they also handle things like implicit solvers for stiff problems, they handle things like symplectic solvers um, for things like Hamiltonian, uh, Hamiltonian problems, things like that. Um, dot, 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 you get the idea. Code is simple, this is amazing. So this is great for me, as I said, as a library author. Um, my hope is that this is a thing that keeps going. This is a thing that other people use when they write their own differential equation solving libraries. Because obviously, Diffrax is not the final word, right? You know, someone will have some other cool idea in you know, the next year, five years, 10 years, whenever, right? Uh, and someone will come along and write their own differential equation solving library, and it, it will be amazing. Um, and, and my hope is that you know, this, the, these insights can be useful to all future uh, software developers and open source software developers uh, working on similar sorts of problems. Um, but more than that, for you as a user, as an end user who doesn't care about how the library does it, you just want to use the library. Um, actually, this reduction has a lot of advantages for you as well, in particular with respect to advanced use cases. Um, so it means, for example, maybe you want to solve an OD and an SD at the same time, maybe in parallel, or maybe one of them affects the other or something like that. Um, you can do that. This is not difficult because they all sit under a unified umbrella. Um, maybe you want to do something like a controlled stochastic differential equation. This is a pretty neat kind of thing to see appearing in a few times. Um, you can do that too. There's no issue with that. Uh, if I if I go back up here and then I, where, is it, where did I write it? Here we go. So I write it down here. Term equals drift component plus diffusion component. But if I wanted to, I could just add in another term here. Right, and I could do you know, my 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 control vector field and then whatever that control is. I, I could I could write that out and that would be totally fine. I would just have another term. No issues. Um, lots and lots of solvers uh, also demand special structure. It, it need to look at special structure. So we've already seen this FDW as a, as a matrix vector product, but actually there's a bunch of other solvers which, which decompose this vector matrix and vector product and do something clever with it. So this is something like minimal repertoire. Um, and once again, you can implement this. This is fine. Um, you know, the, the abstractions are such that you can work with complicated solvers and complicated advanced use cases and you don't need to like do complicated stuff. You're not, you know, this isn't weird hackery to make this work. Um, okay, so I've got one other point on the internals that I want to discuss. So this is uh, what I refer to as parameterized functions, like how these keep appearing. So when you think of this, this defect solve operation, this is, this is this important entry point that we've seen appearing many, many times. This consumes parameterized functions as inputs. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that let's say let's say we have a solver. So in, in our examples earlier today, we saw say Dopey five, we saw Euler's method, um, but we might have some some other solver as well. So here I've written Kvenno three. That's just another differential equation solver. Um, and and this in turn, this is some parameterized function. That is to say, it's a function. Say solver dot step. This is a function. This is an operation. This does something, but it's parameterized. Um, it is you know it depends upon this these these parameters. Say like a butcher tableau. Um, the, the choice of nonlinear solver, da, 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 all the things that define this particular solver as being this particular solver uh, means that this step operation is, is parameterized by these, these quantities. We have things like the step size controller. So today we just took constant step sizes, but I told you that we could choose more advanced ones like PID controllers. Uh, and yes, in this case, once again, we end up with the same thing that you have some function, some, some operation, in which case this changing of the step size and this is parameterized by things like the tolerance. How accurately do you want your solve, your differential equation to be solved? Uh, it's parameterized by, you know, what, what are the allowed minimum and maximum sizes of your step sizes? Any particular places you want to put your step sizes? Dot, 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 dot. Um, so again, what you see is that this is an instance of a parameterized function. Uh, and now this is going to get even more complicated, so don't worry if I lose you at this point. Um, but let's suppose you want to do one of these custom backpropagation methods. Well, then actually at this point, what you've got is an entire backward pass which is in turn parameterized by these solvers and step size controllers, which are themselves also parameterized functions. So you have these like, you know, hyper parameterized functions, neto parameterized functions, whatever you want to call them, um, which are parameterized functions or parameterized functions. Um, and you can see this, you know, this starts getting a little bit complicated, a little bit difficult to reason about. Um, and it's actually because of this that Diffrax actually resulted in this spin out project called Equinox, 
um, which kind of gets billed as a neural network library, but it's actually a lot more than that. And that's what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, oh, and don't worry if I lost you on this slide and I started talking about like weird differential equation stuff that, that you've not seen before, um, because what we're now going to see is, is a much more uh, closer to home example of a parameterized function. And that is to say a neural network. So what we're going to do is we're going to write, represent a parameterized function. You know, it is to say some operation, but it has some, you know, some theta that parameterizes it. We're going to write this as a pie tree. This is the, this is the one trick that makes Equinox work. So let's imp import this Equinox library, this spin out Equinox library. That, that Diffrax depends upon, that, that came out of Diffrax and out of a need to solve the problems of the previous slide. So we we're going to import that, we're going to import Jax alongside it. And now I'm going to show you how we write down just a simple linear layer, just a, you know the simplest possible neural network using Equinox. So you can see we start off with this nice familiar looking PyTorch-like syntax. You know, you, I think this, is, this has been appearing in every library since PyTorch, right? There's always some sort of module object. Um, and we have this weight in the bias. These, these are the two sort of like parts of the pie tree. So linear here, this is going to be some pie tree. And then weight and bias are the, are the two sub pie trees, the two, the two nodes coming off of it. And then how do we initialize those nodes? Well, we just define an init method. And then if you, if you just have a quick read to this, you can see that it, this is just doing standard Jack stuff, right? Nothing fancy here. I, I've just, I've just passed in a couple of integers to say, to say what my weight and my bias should be. And then I've just, I've just initialized those as normal random variables. Um, but of course, this is a parameterized function. What all I've written down so far is a bag of parameters. I need the function part. I need a forward pass. And that just might, might just look like this. And again, again, just from a Python point of view, all I've done is define a call method. That's that's kind of a completely expected, right? This is how you call an, call an object, call a class. And you can see we do a matrix multiply of weight against vector and then our element bias. So you can see that what we end up with here is this very sort of friendly looking PyTorch inspired, deliberately PyTorch inspired syntax for creating um, creating a neural network, or indeed creating any parameterized function, including all the complicated ones we saw on the previous slide. I mean, it's a nice, funny looking PyTorch syntax. Um, and the really cool thing is that because um, what, what, what it is, when I, when I, sub, when I subclass Equinox to a module, what I'm doing is registering the linear as a custom PyTree. Because that's the only thing that's happening here, the only thing that's happening is that linear is a PyTree. It means I'm now safe to do things like this, where I just instantiate my, my model. This is now a PyTree, model is a PyTree. And therefore, I can, and, you know, Jack knows how to work with PyTrees. I can just pass model in. It's just a pie tree and everything just works. And this is the this is one I think one of the big points of Equinox. For for those of you doing neural networks, and uh, you're probably used to using like Flax or Haiku or something. Well, Flax and Haiku, you know, these really built these domain-specific languages on top of Jax. They very much sit on top of Jax. You can't, you know, fearlessly interchange Jax and your library. Um, you can't just put the two of them together freely. Um, and this is why you know you end up with things like flax.linen.jit and flax.linen.scan and da, 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 and all the rest of it, right? Um, but here, you know, we don't need that. We can just use Jackson and that just works. So that's pretty cool, right? Because we just and that's this is all coming out of this one idea. This one idea that we should make our models be pie trees by using these existing Jacks Jax abstractions rather than building in new ones. So that's kind of cool. Um, mathematically, what we're doing here is I'm saying that I want my higher order function g to see this parameterization theta in f theta. And this high order function, when I say high order function, I just mean that it accepts another function as an input. And if you're thinking, hang on, wait, what? Where did those come from? Well, actually, we already saw that. That was on the previous slide, right? This is compute loss. This is a higher order function. All of your loss functions have always been high order functions because they've taken a forward pass, this call of this model. They've taken in this forward pass, that's a function. And then your compute loss is a function of that function. It's a high order function. Um, so you can see that actually, this is exactly what we've been doing here. F theta is my model or my, my parameterized loss function. And then G is the evaluation of that loss function. So we've been doing this all along. You've all been doing this all along, pretty much no matter which library you've been using. And so what, what we're trying to do here is have G see this theta so that we can compute gradients with respect to it or JIT with respect to it or on, and so on and so on. Um, and these parameterized functions, you know, these keep appearing everywhere. This is this is really cool. So we've already seen just now how neural networks are these parameterized functions and how you know, this is a useful abstraction. Uh, and then a few slides ago, I also showed you differential equation solvers and how this needs parameterized functions in lots and lots of places. Um, but these appear, as I say, these appear absolutely everywhere. Let's consider, say, a data loader. 
So a data loader, you know, you load some data and then just spits it into your model. So this is like a next batch function. This goes and gets the next next batch. And this is this is a function that's parameterized by the training data. Things like optimizers. This is a very very classic example as well, where making a step of your optimizer, a step of gradient descent, a step of Adam, something like this. This is a function parameterized by the learning rate, or if it's Adam, maybe it's parameterized by you know B two one and B two two and things like that. Um, uh, things like wrapper functions, you see disappearing quite a lot, right? That you, you've got some function here, you've got some function of X, but you're, you're passing it into, into some other API that demands two arguments. You can see X and you've got this other argument. That's, that's quite a common thing to have happen. You need, to, you need to match an API somewhere. So you wrap your function up in something. And this is a very easy way of doing it, right? This, this is exactly what you do. You can see we've, we've just created this new PyTree. That what this, all this PyTree does is it, can it wraps this function and has a forward pass. Uh, that is to say, just this call method that just evaluates this function whilst whilst respecting the API that, that, that we needed to respect. Um, in particular, by the way, a lot of people uh, have often tried to work around this by just wrapping into like a wrapping into a lambda function or something like that. Um, but if you do that, then you end up with a different lambda function every time you wrap it, and maybe that doesn't play well with like JSON grad and so on, where you like recompile needlessly. But as long as you work with the abstractions that Jax introduces, as long as you already do use PyTrees as Jax understands, then you can avoid that kind of overhead. Um, abstract parameterized functions. So we've already seen several, some of these. I've already shown you abstract solver. I've already shown you abstract term. Um, so that was, you know, these are examples of abstract uh, parameterized functions in the context of differential equations. So it's very, very common that you want your, uh, you know, you need your solver to have a step method, right? Um, you need things like that. And yeah, you can absolutely go ahead and define these um, just, in, just in a normal way using Python. Because once again, Equinox just integrates with Jax, integrates with normal Python in exactly the way you always expect it to. Um, this is also a nice moment, by the way, to uh, yeah, highlight how this is, what, this is this is step. And on the previous example, we had call. Uh, no method is special cased. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, you, use whatever you like, and then you can either do you know my thing dot step, or you can just do my thing and then just call it with brackets. Um, it, it doesn't matter. This, this will all work. Uh, and likewise, you could introduce multiple methods. Maybe you're building a VAE, and you have both an encoder and de and a decoder. So you have an encoder and a decoder. You've got two parameterized functions parameterized by the same quantities. But well, once again, this just works, right? You just define your quantities up here, up at the top, and then you just do, you know, def encode, da, 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 whatever, def decode, da, 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 whatever. And again, this works. Um, so these are lots and lots, lots and lots of examples of parameterized functions. Um, what's kind of neat, actually, is that this equinox.module thing can be used sort of like slightly sneakily for a few other things as well, which I think are kind of cool. Um, so for example, maybe you just need a custom collection of objects. Um, so you can do this, you know, in sort of similar fashion using like a tuple or a named tuple or a dictionary or something, just try and pack all of your, your quantities together in, in, in some meaningful operation, so in some meaningful structured type. Um, but, um, you can use a construct module just as a convenient way to do this as well. So you can just use the same thing multiple times without having to use two different pieces of technology. So that's kind of neat. Um, also, maybe you want to use strings inside a jax.jit region. But of course, a string is not a Jax type. And Jax does not have to work, does not know how to work with strings uh, until now, until you do this. And then you can see what I've actually done here is I've just taken some string and I, I then I on the fly define some custom pi tree whose wrapper is the string that I want it to be. And as a result, now whenever I whenever I print out this this Jax type M, right, this is a thing that Jax knows how to work with because it's a pi tree. And now whenever I print this out, I get I you know it, it appears as this string. That I, that I needed to. So maybe you can use it to represent error messages or something like this inside JIT. So you can see that there's actually kind of uh, quite a lot of cool things we can do with, with this uh, single equinox.module abstraction. So you've seen how um, this was really motivated by a need to solve problems in Defrax, by a need to you know, solve these scientific computing problems in JAX, in, um, and that sort of like spun out into neural networks into doing lots and lots of other things besides. So you have heard of it, have probably thought of Equinox as a neural network library, and I'm here to tell you that's great and it's amazing, and actually you can do so much more than that too. Um, so on that note, I think that brings me to the end of my talk. So this is uh, my final slide. So um, if you want to know more about Defrax, if you want to go and use Defrax, if you want to go and solve some differential equations, that is available on the GitHub. Um, if you want to dig into Equinox, either just for curiosity or because you probably want to solve some neural networks, likewise, available on my GitHub. Um, uh, I do. Please do feel free to just send me an email or put me on Twitter if any of you want to know more. If you have, if you have any questions later, uh, and of course, finally, if you have any questions now, then go ahead. So, ta-da! Um, there was a comment. So, this is being streamed to two places: one where people had uh -huh. signed up, uh, 
the comment was thank you now we can do molecules plus chit plus pmap in jax mm mm-hmm. i'm glad to hear it um let me see if there are any other questions would it be possible uh, so this question is by pablo rodriguez uh great talk and great library would it be possible to solve pdes with diffrax right yes um depends on the pde and depends on the problem you, on how you want to solve it so if you start with a pde now you semi discretize it by a method of lines or something like that well then of course mathematically all you're doing is discretizing your pde into an ode and diffrax can solve an ode so if you, if you want to do something like that then yes absolutely is the answer um of course the field of pde numerics is a very large and very complicated one where you end up with lots and lots of specialized solvers for special cases um and it's definitely out of scope for diffrax to try and do you know all of those because that's that's you know there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those um so in short anything that can be sensibly re- reduced to an ode yes absolutely and in practice that usually means something like finite difference and just not finite element or finite volume mm. oh thanks for answering that got a couple of questions yeah. <laughs> so so we had the jacksem the library author here uh-huh. uh, i don't know if you've seen uh-huh. that uh, so I, when, when i saw your diffusion example it was like oh, okay maybe maybe you can do similar stuff uh, what, what are the differences between like what the md community does and like these uh, sds they're kind of related Right. I mean, I got to be honest, I'm probably not well equipped to answer that. I've never looked that closely at molecular dynamics and molecular and MD simulations. Um, so sure, I don't know. I'm not the expert on that. Interesting. I I I did take a look, but it seems that they 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 were a bit, little bit more lax on how they advance to the next step. I don't know how to Yeah, so I'm for what it's worth like a lot of these things are built around a differential equation solver somewhere. Uh, I think I remember poking side Jack's MD at some point and seeing they had like some Verlet integrator or something inside there. Um yeah, I guess that, that is, one. Yeah, so I mean if I go back to like uh, Seems they care more uh, about yeah, the statistics yeah. of the of the whole system more than the accuracy was what I got. Um I mean, well, what I was actually going to say is this: this point one here. You know, maybe you want to write your own simulator. I mean, this is kind of the sort of example I had in mind, where maybe you are writing down like an MD simulator or something like that, and you don't want to write your own Verlet method, or you want to be able to use like a single API and like switch out your your um, your synthetic solver for some other kind of solver, uh, or you know, blah 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 blah, anything like that. Or maybe you want to adapt your step size as you're going along, and that's kind of a fact by yourself. Um, this is exactly the kind of use case which I think this this point addresses. um where you know you could use diffrax as a dependency and then just use that to to do all the differential equation solving you need to do um whilst you know you go ahead and do all the interesting md stuff um, can can you talk about the well this internal but i chatted with you about this the <laughs> the vector a uh, like structure you you created and 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 maybe related to mm-hmm. to stevens a uh, Yeah, uh, tree math thing. Yeah, tree math. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are two very, very similar concepts. Um, and I mean, the thing I use is, as you say, internal. Um, but in retrospect, everyone else. So in, in fact, is everyone else should be using tree math. Um, yeah. So this is where. Um, where did I have it? So I had this thing where I wrote down um, that we can use pipes as the state. So um, this is something where you. Like you, you have this pie tree, and you're you're passing this along. Your pie tree is evolving. Your state is evolving. It's changing. It's changing, and your solver keeps updating it. Um, but what you really like to be able to write down inside your differential equation solver is just something like you know, like state plus dt times change in state. Um, and you can't write that down if you have a pie tree, right? You end up doing like you know, jacks dot tree map plus da 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 jacks dot tree map multiplication you know dt times change in state da, da, da. and you end up with all these, these millions and millions of ugly jacks dot tree maps everywhere um, that you know like your code works but your code isn't readable so um, instead um, what uh, that we ended up introducing was this thing called omega which is it, it literally it's like it's just like tree math it's just like a, a neater notation frankly Um, so you so you can write down so this, this is this is you know, this is what we want to write down right this is this is say an explicit Euler's method in code right I I I will write down something like that as a line of code 
Um, but I want to be able to do this as um, uh, with, with PyTrees here as the state. And so one option is just to go ahead and wrap all of these objects into a PyTree, so it, into some object that automatically does all this for you. And that's exactly what um, we do. So this is where what I end up doing is introducing this omega object. And then doing that. So you can see what we do is we somehow take y0 and we raise it. So you can see we've got this notation with the, the, um, the, the power here, our power. Um, you can see we raise it into this omega object and then do that for all of our objects. And then we, then we just lower it again afterwards. So this now actually does the mathematics that we want it to whilst having this quite neat notation. Um, and this is, and for those of you who know what tree math is and have seen tree math, this is essentially the same thing. It's just with a slightly different notation. Um, so I think that that's a kind of like, a, it's just a neat trick for writing down these things in, in both a way that's easy to read and a way that's, um, you know, so I actually handle the generality we wanted to. And, and by the way, if this R power notation looks a little bit magic to you, it's just something that's been deliberately overloaded to, 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 to just do this. It just gives us a prettier notation for this one thing. It's just been overloaded. The top, the top line has been overloaded to do the same thing as the bottom line. Um, yeah, anyway. On. Awesome. Uh, should I take some community questions, Christian? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I just was reading them. Okay. Uh, so this is by Pablo Ashwell. Um, did you compare performance of solving ODEs versus approximation with RNNs? Most people are all skeptical, are still skeptical about performance of differential solvers. I guess this will change with Artifrax and JAX. Right. So, I mean, if you're trying to solve an ODE with an R and N, so you're, you're looking at something like a physics informed neural network or something coming out of that end of the community, um, this is something which really only makes sense in like quite niche scenarios. It really, it's really only sensible if you're doing like a high dimensional PDE or like a non local PDE or something, you know, something awful like that. Um, in, in every other respect, traditional mathematical solvers are just, you know, orders of magnitude more efficient than anything you're going to find coming out of the machine learning community. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because people have spent a lot of time, multiple decades, optimizing these solvers to be very, very good. Um, and if you're going to like train a custom solver of loads and loads of training data, this is this is a huge hassle that actually doesn't get you any better. Um, so yeah, you can go ahead and use RNNs if you want to. Um, but for most use cases, I would say just lean on the standard mathematical ways of handling these problems. Awesome. Um, Jonathan asks, great to see you, Jonathan, in the chat. Um, Equinox looks very elegant. Do you have plans for uh, lots of things to add, or do you feel that it is close to complete? Um, I mean, never say never, but Equinox, I think, feels relatively complete to me at this point. It's got um, pretty much uh, certainly all of like the basic neural network layers you expect to see in it. You know, it's got attention, it's got RNNs, it's got you know convolutional layers, um, it's got pooling. You know, dot 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 exactly, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so in that respect, I think it's, you know, it's already got all of the, the, the toolbox one really needs. Um, but conversely, you know, if there, if there is some cool layer or something that you think would make sense to appear in a general purpose library, uh, then, you know, go ahead, write the layer, open a PR, something like that, open a pull request. Um, uh, you know, it's, I'm some, this is something I'm very, very happy to take community contributions on and help grow this tool if it's useful for others. Awesome. Uh, thanks for answering that. There's one more community question. This is by Connor. Um, they say amazing library and amazing talk. If you are solving an ODE or SDE in the latent layer, example, a neural ODE or neural SDE, do you have to specify an adjoint method when you set up the solver or will Diffrax automatically choose one for you? Right. Um, so Diffrax has a sensible default. Um, in the sense that it will perform what's known as discretized and optimized. Um, but if you want to use a different uh, backpropagation method, then you can totally do that. And in particular, you could switch it out and say optimize and discretize. Um, and there's like checkpointing things and things like that floating around in there as well. Um, if you prefer forward mode auto differentiation, then yes, you know, Jack supports this and therefore Diffrax supports this as well. Um, so if you're the kind of person who wants to customize this and do the thing you want to do, yes, you can absolutely. Uh, go ahead and do that. And if, by the way, you ever want to write your own um, note, your own uh, adjoint method, then abstract adjoint is absolutely a thing. You can subclass that. You can write your own. Um, if conversely you're just you're just a user of these things and you just want to use a particular one, um, or you uh, or you're not an expert in this at all and you just want a smart default, you want the facts to do something reasonable for you without you having to worry about it. 
um, then yes, that's absolutely the case. The fact the fact has a sensible default that, that will just work in like ninety five percent of use cases. So. Um... I see a few more questions, so I'll, I'll ask them quickly. Uh, I hope that's okay with the Christian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Usually, Christian asks a lot of interesting questions, so I want to make sure I let him ask those. <laughs> um, Ian asks, "Does uh, Diffrax work with stiff systems?" I'm, me, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so for context here for everyone else, a, a stiff problem is, in some sense, like it's a difficult differential equation to solve numerically. Um, the, the term stiff is a little bit imprecise, but basically it's just, you know, anything that's difficult to solve numerically. So yes, Defax totally supports stiff systems. Um, so the main ones here, uh, we've got things like Caverno 3 and Caverno 4, Caverno 5, etc. Um, so these um, are a class of uh, explicit singly diagonal implicit one cutter methods, uh, and Defax supports these. Um, I would certainly like to go ahead and add a whole bunch of other stuff. So things, I don't know, Adam's bashboard molten methods and things like that. Um, I haven't done that yet. I, I've just focused specifically on these STEC methods, um, but there's no reason why you couldn't add anything else. And if this is important to anyone, then, you know, get in touch. Um, I'm definitely interested to hear from you. Um, I'll take this uh, last question from the community. Can diffracts be used for PTEs? I think this was already covered. Uh, yeah, I think we had that one at the start. Patrick, I have a random question, but I mm -hmm. I think about this every time I see like these kind of things. And then I think of, okay, Jax, okay, Jax has access to TPUs, right? Mm -hmm. would, would, I mean, if you have a system with a lot of particles, let's call them, uh, like, is it possible to leverage having multiple machines and somehow and to perform this computation? This. Yeah. I mean, honestly, this is just JAX as normal at this point, right? Um, if, you, if you have multiple machines and you want to do JAX.pmap or JAX.pjet and you know, broadcast everything over them, uh, or sort of parallelize over them, sorry, um, then yeah, go ahead and do that. And because Defrax and Equinox, these, these are all pure JAX libraries, right? There's nothing magical here. Um, you, I encourage you, anyone curious, to just go digging into the source code of these, by the way. Um, nothing magical My here. My main these question was, like, if, if you do a pmap, mm -hmm. But you're then you're doing a scan over all of this, right? Mm -hmm. So so I'm guessing there's a lot of details of how to synchronize information such that it makes sense. I don't know if there's a detail here. Uh, I don't think so. I think it should just work. I mean, fundamentally, you're just running a for loop on you know multiple different machines, and then when they're all done, you know they all get back together and say, "I got this result. I got this result," and so on. Um, uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Maybe I'm I'm thinking if let's say. You split the state in, in different mm -hmm. ones, and maybe they oh, you want to pin up inside the operation. Yeah, I was thinking, so, what if you have so many particles that you have to split? Right. Okay, I mean, first of all, yes, this should just work because the, um, you know Jax has this amazing um, you know, sort of composability. So yeah, I, I expect that to work. Um, in practice, if you absolutely can, if, if it's at all possible, and in like 99% of use cases, it will be possible, I'd recommend putting the PMAP outside the differential equation so you know, you swap these two operations. Um, mm -hmm. And then just, you know, because you're probably talking about like a large batch size or something here, right? Yeah, you know, I was imagining, I don't know, I'm, I'm not an astrophysicist, but something mm -hmm. like, oh, let's simulate a galaxy or... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know how heavy they are, but I was thinking, oh, mm -hmm. they, they require supercomputers, but what if you can do mm -hmm. it with just... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, like uh, one of these TPUs, that would be, yeah. I mean, I mean interesting this, to This do. sounds like a cool use case. Um, I've not tried it, you know, I've not tried simulating a galaxy with the flags, but like, at least in principle, this sounds possible. And if anyone gives that a try, you know, I'd love to hear from you. That sounds like, sounds like a cool project. <laughs> yeah, it would be amazing if somebody comes up with that. Mm -hmm. um, awesome, we still have a few minutes. So Christian, if you have any other questions you want to ask? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's more of a, um, I don't know, like a general question, like, mm -hmm. and the, the, it seems like the neural, like, how, how, how you call them, neural, uh, yeah, not, but the, yeah, neural differential equations, they, they, they've been around for a while, right? And I think mm -hmm. your thesis has a little bit to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my thesis is, is a whole thing, but yeah, go on. <laughs> Like, I don't know if you can, like, maybe give a hint of 
like what is happening in the field and if you can start using the frex for that kind of applications mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um i mean sort of you know, sort of the clarity here this is no longer like a jack's problem so much as it's a, you know like, a, like an academia research sort of discussion um but uh, i think a lot of what we're starting to see now is people just using neural differential equations and just you know, using the theory that we and you know obviously everyone else built up uh over these these research papers um, and so, you, you know, you're seeing people being like, oh, I, you know, I, I went and tackled some problem trying to model the internal state of a battery using a neural ODE, or I tried to go and model some financial markets using a neural SDE. Um, and I think what we're, really, what we're starting to see now is a lot of like the dividends of this kind of abstract research now actually starting to get used in practice, um, which I think is very cool. Um, conversely, there's no shortage of open questions in the field of neural differential equations. Um, and if anyone's really curious to know more about those or, you know, wants to work on any of them, then, you know, well, as I say, please ping me. I'm always happy to hear from people. Um, but um, that's getting into like quite specialized stuff. Where I like to start talking about like you know custom numerical solvers, reversible solvers, hypersolvers, da, 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 da. and that's that's a that's a very niche discussion. In in the uh, I'm, I'm I'm guessing what you would do is that you're like the, the functions you are coding instead of just being something simple like minus y would be like a be neural a network. Problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and it's the kind of thing where, like, actually, if we go up to that linear operation, yeah, here we go. Is, is there, like, so, an abstraction for this? Is like, a specific one? In, no, there's no right? specific abstraction. You just need to match an API. Um, so in this case, like, let, let's suppose you wanted to use, a, like, yeah, this uh, learned linear layer as your vector field. Uh, that's totally that's totally fine. You just need to change your API here from accepting x to accepting t, comma, y, comma, args. So you need to accept t. The, the time of your differential equation solve, y, the state at that point, time t, and then any args, any like extra information that's held constant throughout the entire solve. Mm. Um, so you change okay. your core method to, to accept that as an argument and to return the appropriate value. And, and then, for example, every, and then the rest of this code goes through completely unchanged. Uh, and then I could use, say, a learned linear layer as, as my vector field. That's awesome. I, like, mm -hmm. I, I feel that for certain applications, it, it's kind of an alternative for recurrent layers, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I've not got into any of this at all, but um, no, so like a, uh, the continuous limit of a recurrent neural network is in fact a neural controlled differential equation. So I've been I've been discussing these controlled differential equations earlier. Well, actually, if you put the word neural in front, um, then actually, yeah, this is also in fact the continuous limit of a recurrent neural network. So yes, absolutely, there are links to uh, recurrent neural networks. And if anyone's curious to know more about that, um, then go ahead and ha go and have a look at my thesis, which really discusses all of this in you know ludicrous amounts of detail. Uh, just like a a very I don't know like I'm guessing because I mean recurrent layers and especially LSTMs they have been around for a while. But mm -hmm. you think you think uh, in practice people should try to use more like start going depends. towards this uh, yeah neural differential mm -hmm. yeah depends a lot on the problem honestly i mean this is something where if you are using a recurrent neural network then you know somehow secretly you are already using a differential equation and so you know i don't really care if you use the explicitly discretized rnn or the continuous time differential equation of the defect solver um that you know th there are definitely use cases where each one is more appropriate so um, so to answer your question of you, know, when would you use a defect differential equation and explicitly use a differential equation? It's when you have things like irregularly sampled data in a time series, or like missing data in a time series, um, or, or alternatively, maybe de very, very densely sampled data in a time series, where if you were to do that with an R and N, you know, you'd have to process each point sequentially and that would take forever. But if you lean on the mathematics of differential equation solvers, you can use things like an adaptive step size controller. That was that PID controller I mentioned earlier. Um, where, where have we got that? Um, and then because you now use something like an adaptive step size controller, uh, here we go, this thing here, um, then you can like adaptively, you know, take in the, the right amount of data for each step. Um, so you see that the, these different, the different, the continuous time differential equation approach is particularly use suitable for like these complicated use cases. Um, uh, and in every other use case, it's just exactly the same as an RN. My, <laughs> sorry, my last question is that this topic mm -hmm. seems to touch so many areas. Like, I, I think I asked you this uh, once, but uh, like lately diffusion methods have been become very popular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it seems that, uh, again, they're somehow linked to, 
to to this can, can mm -hmm. you talk about <laughs> this uh, connection yeah yeah so absolutely there were connections um so in terms of like the sort of diffrax equinox sort of like scientific computing end of things um then yeah go have go ahead and have a look actually at the documentation for for equinox yeah and that actually includes an example of train and score-based diffusion just on a toy example just on mnist you know it's just it's just quite a small example um but it, it, it trains a toy example on mnist uh, as a score-based diffusion and it, and it solves the differential equations involved using diffrax um so on that end of things you know that that is there um and, and actually also just as a quick sign as a quick advert for anyone interested in working with score-based diffusions then the example in in the, the documentation for equinox is the shortest, simplest, cleanest example of score-based diffusions that I know of, like anywhere. Um, so that may be helpful for, for some. Um, and then in terms of the sort of like the more theoretical end of things, yeah. So score-based diffusions are essentially an alternative training method of what we refer to in the neural differential equation community as a continuous normalizing flow. Um, these two things are somehow the same object. And the real innovation of the score-based diffusion uh, compared to what you know was already happening was that it was a training method that worked in parallel over time. Um, and I don't know how much sense this is going to make to people without the appropriate background, but we had this way of training these things called continuous normalizing flows that involved solving a differential equation, which was, you know, moderately expensive. And then a score-based diffusion was this really, really smart way of like skipping the solve uh, and then cutting out an expensive component in the, in the, in the training. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There were really, really, really cool things there. Yeah, that, that, that is really cool. I know, I, I, I hope, that eventually the community of diffusion, yeah, I, I'm guessing, generate, because generative models are kind of state of the art, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be amazing if they start like uh, binding a little bit together. Mm -hmm. I, I played around a bit, and what, what you showed with the, um, yeah, the brown emotion, it makes like a lot of sense. The, the, the only thing I wonder, because I remember there's kind of these beta schedules in some of the, in the literature mm -hmm. of diffusion models. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it would be possible to somehow in, include that here with the frax. Yeah, I mean, this is essentially what you've just described as a hyperparameter. So yeah, like, you know, go ahead and modify your hyperparameters however you wish. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, this I think does appear in, in the example in, in the documentation for Equinox. There is, there is a beta described there, which you could change if you wanted to. Um, and then actually, I, I suppose sort of in, in respect to what you were saying just at the start there, whether there's like other connections that are yet to be drawn. Uh, yes, I reckon there probably are. Um, I, you know, we've done a whole bunch of work on like neural stochastic differential equations. We've done a whole bunch of work on continuous normalizing flows. There's now this whole line of work on score-based diffusions. Um, I think there's got to be all kinds of interesting papers yet to be written combining these approaches that just hasn't happened yet. Uh, and I think that's going to be very, very exciting to, to see what that brings, see what the future brings. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, so much stuff uh, related to this concept. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, are there other questions, uh, Samyan? I, I think we're out of time, so I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Okay, uh, I'll quickly again mention Patrick's uh, Twitter handle, so make sure everyone, uh, you follow him there and check out the GitHub link for all, all of the stuff we shared today. If you signed up, we'll be sending an email out where you can find all of this so you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, also, follow Christian on Twitter. His handle is ccarcia88. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick and Christian, again, for another awesome Jack's talk. Uh, I'm, I, I understand a few words here and there all, all the time <laughs> here for, with these, but it's always I go back and watch and learn so much. So thanks. Thanks for your time. No worries. Thank you a lot for having me. Awesome, Patrick. Thanks a lot. It was super interesting.